Good morning. I will call the February 13th, 2014 regular meeting of the Minneapolis City Council Zoning and Planning Committee meeting to order. I'm Lisa Bender. I chair this committee and I am joined by my colleagues, council members, Reich, Goodman, Johnson, and Warsami. And we do expect council member Barb Johnson to join us today. We ha and we have a quorum. So today's agenda has 12 items. Uh, the way it's written is the public hearing is listed first and then the consent is second. Uh, I'm going to start with the consent agenda. So starting with item six. <clears throat> item six is a target field station street vacation resolution. Uh, and the motion is to approve the corrected legal description of the state vacation, um, which was approved by the city council on November 12th. And this is just a clarification of the language. Item number seven is arts commission appointments to approve the following two-year appointments and waive the residency requirement for David, David Kang for the Minneapolis Arts Commission. Brenda Bell Brown from Ward 6, Deanna Newman from Ward 7, James Barch from Ward 12, Robert Hunter from Ward 8, David Kang from Ward 5, Cole Dorius from Ward 9, Haley Finn from Ward 10, Sarah Lopez from Ward 8, and to approve the following one-year appointment to the Minneapolis Arts Commission from, for Eric Bruce from Ward 10. And these are a mix of mayoral and council appointments. Item number eight is to approve the petition by Fats, F Pat Fitzgerald to rezone the property located at 716 and 718 West 34th Street from R2B to C1 Neighborhood Commercial District. Item number nine is uh, regarding a petition by James Smart with Smart Associates on behalf of Paul Dobsner to rezone the property at 4000 and 4008 Lindale Avenue South from R1A to C1. Item number 10 is Walgreens Pharmacy to approve the petition by Semper Development to rezone the properties located at 2600 through 2622 Central Avenue Northeast from C1 to C2 to allow for a drugstore and a drive through facility. Item number 11 is to approve the petition by David Barnhart to rezone the property located at 2827 Williams Avenue Southeast from C2 to R4 multifamily residential district and TP transitional parking overlay district to allow for additional surface parking in a children's play area serving the commercial and office uses that are there. Item number 12 is to approve a petition by Fager ba D Baker Daniels on behalf of the Northern Clay Center to rezone the northern portion of the property located at 2424 Franklin Avenue East from R6 to C2 to allow for an educational arts center, gallery, and accessory parking and to approve the vacation of a no outlet alley which abuts the property located at 2424 Franklin Avenue East. Would anyone like to pull any of the items from the consent agenda? Seeing none, I will move the consent agenda. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. The consent agenda items are adopted. Uh, we'll now move to our public hearing, which is items one through five. The first item is uh, City Planning Commission reappointment um, to consider the reappointment of Ryan Kronzer from Ward 10 to serve on the Minneapolis City Planning Commission for a term to run from February 1st, 2014 through January 31st, 2016. Is there anyone here to speak about this item? Seeing none, I will move the reappointment of Ryan Kronzer to the Minneapolis City Planning Commission. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. The motion carries. The second item on our public hearing is regarding 3112 Third Avenue South. It is an appeal ap filed by David Peel from the Heritage Preservation Commission's approval of a certificate of appropriateness application to replace windows and a door at 3112 Third Avenue South in the Healy Block Historic District. Uh, and I believe we'll begin with staff. Is that correct? Thanks. That's correct, Madam Chair. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is John Smoley, here to brief you on an appeal of a certificate of appropriateness application to replace 16 windows and a wood door at 3112 Third Avenue South in our Healy Block Historic District. The appellant is David Peel, here today. The applicant are representatives of our city's health department here as well. The proposal is a lead hazard reduction project initiated in response to a child who was lead poisoned at the property. 
the property owners have received a lead hazard reduction grant funded by the U.S. Housing and Urban Development Agency and administered by our city's health department. Staff recommended and the Heritage Preservation Commission approved the proposal at their January 7, 2014 meeting by a vote of 7 to 3. CPED is withholding issuance of a building permit to conduct these lead abatement activities pending the results of the appeal. This is the home as it appeared around 1890 and it, as it appeared late last year. I should note as well we haven't received public comment, formal public comment on the project, though the neighborhood group has expressed uh, verbal support for the HPC's uh, decision. So the applicant is proposing to replace uh, historic double hung wood frame windows. The windows themselves are deteriorated. Here are a few examples. Uh, they're proposed to be replaced with nearly identical wood windows. Here you can see a portion of one of those wood windows. We're very pleased that the applicant has proposed uh, true, a true division of lights with wood muntins to separate panes of glass as appeared uh, originally or historically on the property. Many of those muntins, we do have evidence that those have been removed. The applicant is proposing to uh, restore that true division of lights. The windows themselves are deteriorated, and they, have, uh, they are creating lead dust at levels that astronomically exceed safety thresholds, up to 180 times those thresholds in one instance. And this is less than one year after professional cleaning supervised by our health department staff. Uh, furthermore, proportionally few replacements, only two, will occur at the front of the property, where the applicant proposes to retain the large, historic, fixed wood window on the first floor. The proposal itself meets nearly all window guidelines required by the Healy Block Historic District Design Guidelines, including requirements to retain decorative windows, match original window proportions and sizes, and utilize double hung wood replacement windows. One window guideline will not be met, however. Specifically, the applicant is proposing to replace unpainted non-historic aluminum windows with painted aluminum storm windows, when wood storm windows are technically required. Here's a picture of those proposed aluminum storm windows. Due to the low nature of some windows as short as eight inches from the floor in one second story example, the applicant is proposing to install aluminum safety screens designed to support the weight of a person leaning against or falling into them. While wood frames would meet the guidelines, they'd become the weakest link in a feature specifically designed to support weight. Here's how the storms appear in a home listed in the National Register of Historic Places uh, just to our south in Iowa, as seen from the public right-of-way. The applicant is also proposing to replace one paneled wood door at the rear of the property. The district design guidelines require retention of original doors. The appellant makes a decent case that the door is original, but staff has not been able to confirm or deny this assertion. In any event, the door uh, is heavily deteriorated. The applicant will be installing a matching wood door, and the change won't be visible from the public right of way. I'm av available for any questions you may have, and as I mentioned, the appellant and applicant are here as well. Thank you, Mr. Smilly. Do committee members have any questions for staff? Seeing none, I would like the invite the applicant to speak if you have anything you'd like to say to the committee. Madam Chair, Council Members, my name is Daniel Huff. I'm the Director of Environmental Health within the City's Health Department, and we are the applicant. Um, as a uh, city of the, of the first class, Minneapolis is required under State Statute 144.9504 uh, to investigate and order remediation when there is a child with lead poisoning. Uh, we received uh, um, information from the Minnesota Department of Health that this property did have a child with lead poisoning. We uh, investigated, found severely deteriorated lead paint surfaces, um, and moved to uh, order remediation of that property. Um, the family um, in this property meets income guidelines that would apply for grant funds that we receive from uh, U.S. HUD. We, have, uh, we do have a grant that works with property owners to uh, improve the lead safety. Uh, and what we did is we looked at and evaluated various options in this property. 
uh, to restore the wood windows would cost over $28,000, far exceeding our budget in amount for a property under our HUD grant. Our grant uh, um, average expenditure is $10,000 per home. If we are to exceed $20,000, we have to get special dispensation from the U.S. Uh, Housing and Urban Affairs Department. Um, we uh, uh, often contract with a Minneapolis-based company, Acraft Windows, and they can make historically uh, accurate replicas of wood windows, um, and that is what we have uh, requested in this case. Those windows cost uh, just under $10,000. Now, because we are concerned about the safety of children in the house from falling out of the second floor window. As Dr. Smalley mentioned, uh, there is one window in the uh, uh, kitchen, actually, a popular place for children to hang out. That's uh, eight or nine win uh, inches off of the floor, and a child during the summertime, if the window's open, can easily fall out uh, from that second story window. So we want to put uh, safety screens in that window. This would also uh, assist with the aesthetic character of the house. There are currently aluminum clad storm windows on the house. These painted storms have a, a darker color, blend in much more uh, readily with the house than the aluminum clad. Um, and that is for an additional $4,400 that we are using our grant funds for. Um, if we were to replace with wood storms, which as Dr. Smalley said, would not be as secure and safe as uh, these new storms for the child, they would cost, just the wood storms would cost over $11,000, more than the entire window replacement itself. Um, so due to uh, um, cost and safety, um, we have applied um, on behalf of the uh, uh, resident in this property to replace the windows with lead safe windows and to uh, um, install safety uh, storms uh, to prevent any child from, from falling out of the house. Um, I will add that uh, this was a distressed property that was uh, purchased uh, and is now homesteaded by this family. Uh, the purchase price for this home uh, a couple years ago was $50,000. Um, and uh, we want to do everything that we can uh, to ensure the safety of these children uh, and those children that may be moving into the home in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Since the applicant is staff, I'll just ask if the committee has any questions. <coughs> Seeing none, I, um, is the appellant present? When, would, like, would you like to speak? And I'm Chairwoman and Committee. I'm Anders Christensen. I'm a professional painter and painting contractor. I'm the managing partner of Tiger Ox Painting. We have a Minneapolis building contract, Minnesota building contractor's license. We are registered with the EPA as a lead safe contractor. My partner Jeremy and I have both been trained to do work in a lead safe manner. The federal lead law went into effect in June 2010 the law was passed because the primary reason for lead poisoning in children is remodeling done without lead safe practices. The primary reason for lead poisoning in children is remodeling. The law only applies to contractors. Homeowners can do whatever they like. Over the last four years, we've done hundreds of paint jobs, both interior and exterior, involving lead safe practices. We have worked in houses with small children and pregnant women. Our firm was audited by the EPA and passed the audit without any recommendations for change in our work. I am a strong believer in the federal lead law and in lead safety. I have the utmost sympathy for these parents whose child has been diagnosed with lead poisoning. Two of my grandchildren live less than a mile away in a house of the same vintage in the Lindell neighborhood. I commend the Minneapolis Department of Health for pursuing a remedy that will protect these children and this family. However, I strongly disagree with the analysis of the problem and the limited choices 
that the city planner has put forth. Lead abatement is the standard response by HUD. It is the removal of all lead paint. As the report notes, this is an expensive and impractical solution. It is akin to the asbestos removal craze a generation ago. Asbestos is now most commonly encapsulated. The same is true of lead paint today. The HUD standard is out of date. In the construction industry, EPA lead safe encapsulization is the best practice. Lead abatement does not protect children better. For this family, it would be very disruptive. During the outdoor painting season, half of my business is reconditioning and painting windows such as those as 3112 3rd Avenue South. The family would not have to move out during the reconditioning process. The city planner did not investigate reconditioning and painting the original windows as an option. I have not viewed the interior of this house. I've only seen the pictures. But my estimates for this work, based on the photos in the city report, would be 12 hours per window. Install glass where necessary, re-rope, re-glaze, prep, prime, caulk, paint, and wash inside and out, both upper and lower sash windows and interior window surround. $483 per window or $7,728 for 16. I checked with one of my competitors, Bella Casa Painting. They had the same estimate for hours, but charged a slightly higher rate, $510 a window or $8,160. Bella Casa employs a number of Spanish-speaking painters. I think it would be a kindness to the homeowners to have painters working in their house who speak their language. I could find a half a dozen painting contractors in South Minneapolis who could do this job, employing painters who live in the neighborhood. With all the current talk about racial equity and political circles, the city of Minneapolis could put its money literally where everyone's mouth seems to be. John Cunningham, T.P. Healy's great-grandson and prominent Minneapolis architect, purchased 3116 Third Avenue South a year and a half ago. This is the Healy-built house next door to the south. John reconditioned the original sash windows and installed wood frame combination, combination windows manufactured locally by SP Windows. It is incredible to me that city staff did not seek John Cunningham's advice in this matter. This entire appeal is a waste of everyone's time because city staff did not do its due diligence. At least all of you are getting paid, and so is John Smoley. I, however, am donating my time to do his work. The cost of reconditioning and painting the existing windows and installing size wood frame combination windows is $14,700. This is roughly equivalent to the city proposed solution. Lead safe reconditioning and painting of the existing windows is a sustainable choice. Nothing is going to the landfill. One of our goals is a waste free city. Lead safe reconditioning and painting of the existing windows is the preferred choice for the historic district. Lead safe reconditioning and painting of the existing windows supports racial equity and neighborhood employment. Lead safe reconditioning and painting of the existing windows is the current best practice for protecting the children and this family. The bottom line is to protect these children and support this family. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would wish to speak on this matter? Sure. Um, could I ask speakers to please remember to register with the clerk and please state your name and address. And also, um, could you keep remarks um, to please three minutes and try not to repeat uh, what another speaker has already said. Thank I you. I kind of talk a lot, but I'll try. So I'm David Peel, 3127 2nd Avenue South, and uh, I've lived there in the Healy district since shortly after it became a historic district, 21 and a half years ago. And uh, 
I'm also the appellant, and I think the situation here is everybody agrees that the, the lead needs to be dealt with. It's a question of how it gets dealt with. The city agency that deals with that and, and their staff person, Jennifer Cheated, tried to comply the best they could, and they did not get any direction from John Smoley, from what I understand. He just uh, rubber stamped what they requested. And uh, so we've had to do some of the legwork on making sure that happens. Anders mentioned a couple of bids that can, can make it happen within the guidelines, because that is the key objective here, is to comply with the guidelines. The, the new windows that Jennifer proposed uh, do comply. We are interested in wood storm windows, not metal, which are expressly forbidden in the guidelines that have been there for over 20 years, and uh, also the removal of the back door. Now, normally, a neighborhood group in my, my history in the neighborhood, and that's up till a couple of years ago when there's an issue like that, they would flyer the block and get people involved and get some consensus on how to, agree, how to move forward with it, and that has not happened this time. So I've been looking for resources to help uh, make this happen so that it happens within the guidelines. And since the neighborhood group hasn't, they've just chosen to be divisive, apparently. And uh, I, I have found that the, the Healy Project has volunteered to re renovate the back door so that it, at no cost to the family, so that that can be retained. It is not beyond repair. It needs some repair after 120 years but it's in, in decent enough shape to be renovated. And uh, I have another bid for, on uh, the windows and the storm windows that is under the $20,000 range. So apparently there wasn't enough homework being done at the city level. Um, and pr this isn't the first house that on our block that has had to deal with lead, and it's not the first one that's had to deal with it with public resources. Sylvia Bader had the same issue at 3137, probably just about 10 years ago, and uh, everything, all the work that they did complied with the guidelines. That's the key here, is that we want it to comply with the guidelines. And I, I kind of have to ask myself, what's the difference between Sylvia's project complying and suddenly now with a family that, you know, doesn't speak English very well, that the proposal by city staff doesn't comply. I don't think that's fair to them. It's not fair to the block, it's not fair to them, and the rest of us, including myself, have spent a lot of time and money complying with the guidelines. Each deviation from the guidelines weakens them. And if there should be a revision of them at some point that applies to everybody, that's one thing. But these one-off exceptions are very detrimental to the a historic district that's struggling to stay a historic district with the freeway and all of that. And the other argument I hear sometimes from the people who think metal storms are just fine in a historic district is that, well, that house isn't even a Healy, and it's in the Healy district. It happens to be built by Ingham, who is a contemporary of Healy, and it, within the city, just, just about as uh, prolific as, as Healy, and Trilby Bush has put together a lot of history. She's a former HPC commissioner, put a, a lot of history together on the legacy of Ingham. So to try to downplay it by the builder is, is silly because it is historic. It's been declared historic since the 80, late 80s, and uh, to try to question it on those grounds I think are a little bit crazy. Um, uh, Mr. Peel, uh, it's been about four minutes, so I just want to ask you a quick wrap-up, and, and thank okay. you for your time. So what, what I think needs to happen here is we've proven that wood storm windows can be done as cost-effectively as metal storm windows. We've found a resource to pay for the rear door being renovated that won't cost the city or, or the, the homeowner any money. And uh, the proposed new windows comply. It would be better to renovate the old, old ones since it can be done at the same price, but uh, either of those solutions achieve what we're after. Great. Thank you, Mr. Peel. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this issue? storms that are proposed are safety storms. They are not the weakest link as what was sa said. I don't know where staff came up with that idea that they aren't as safe as metal. Madam Chair, committee. My name is Jim Graham. I'm the executive director of the <coughs> National Association for Child Window Safety. After a child had come out of a window in Minneapolis, I had held that child the day before. I started work to change the law. That law called the Layla Law now is being either has been adopted or 
is being considered by 30 states in addition to Minnesota. The real key issue there is that you must have some protection for children. There's a window there that, by the way, 24 inches isn't even safe for a child. The new International Building Code says it must be at least 36 inches. There's a window there that's eight inches off of the floor. A child doesn't have to climb into a window to go out of that window. A child only has to crawl out of that window, and they have a crawling child, by the way. The historic nature and heritage preservation is that that is a family house. Well, that's a death trap now, waiting for a child to go out of. Maybe one hasn't yet, but it is. And the idea that the window screens, well, you put in the wood screens and they will work, is a fallacy. That is not really true. The reason that you need the actual child safety screen, uh, an certified one, is that you need to be able to prevent a child that's up to five years old from going out of that window. As far as the looks, right now it has aluminum, the old 50s type of aluminum on it. I went by it yesterday to look at it. By the way, coming from Iowa, where I was lobbying for them to adopt the same law. And it's, they could put in actual child safety screens into those old aluminum windows, but it wouldn't be historic. The uh, child safety screens have put it, and security screens have been put into historic houses across the country. They're even in the governor's mansion in Wisconsin to preserve that. The new windows that would be going in would certainly look much more historic, the appearance would, than what is there now, that they could get away with leaving, by the way. But I don't think that would be advantageous for the children. I think that Minneapolis, when they, Layla went out of her window and the law was changed, Minneapolis adopted a resolution and made it Layla's uh, day. And here's what was said. We measure the quality of our community by the way we provide for our children, our elders, and our handicapped. It should be the intent of Minneapolis to build community by laying foundations on such principles and to organize its structure to guarantee the safety and happiness of our most vulnerable. It would be an atrocious thing not to allow those children to be safe in that house. And so I ask you to not support a travesty of saying, well, it must be this. I ask you to actually consider what the heritage of the house is, which is a family house, and to protect children as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Would everyone, anyone else like to address the committee in public comment? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Dragan Kolakovic. Uh, I'm a resident at 3108 Third Avenue South. I'm a next door neighbor to the applicant uh, family. And I'm here uh, to strongly support the decision made by the Heritage Preservation Committee to proceed with the replacement of the windows and uh, storms and the door as outlined. Um, I, I've lived in the Healy Block for four years now and I've been intimate with the family since they have moved in. And uh, I've been trying to work with them um, to actually um, get this danger of lead out of their house. And what the city has done and, and proposed, well, at least Heritage Preservation Committee, is adequate. Um, it's adequate. My house is historic as well, and uh, if I wanted to replace my windows, I could choose to do so with uh, replica or identical windows. It is not required to retain my windows. Um, the safety of the children are imperative, so metal uh, screens, I, I think uh, those, those deviation from the, from, from the Healy uh, block guidelines is acceptable in this, in this case. And as far as the back door, there's no evidence proving that the door is historic or not historic. Therefore, uh, replacement of, of that door would be uh, suitable as well. So I urge you to um, uphold the decision made by the Heritage Preservation Committee and uh, move this forward as this has been a colossal waste of time and, uh, and putting a family in danger um, by moving this process through the appeal. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would wish to speak? Seeing, seeing. John Smoley mentioned that he had not received any comment from the public. I have a copy of an email sent to him by John Cunningham, who is the na neighbor on the other side of this property. And that email says, you know, to, to not do the the metal right. and thank you could you um, please uh, give that to the clerk and we can get it submitted into the public record thank you very much uh, is there anyone else 
Okay, seeing none, I'll um, ask my colleagues if there's any comments or questions. Uh, I will move to deny the appeal of uh, the application. Oh, pardon me. I will close the public hearing first. And then I will move to deny the application to appeal the HPC's decision. And I will see if my colleagues have any comments. Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No? Uh, thank you. Uh, the motion passes. In committee, we don't have to second motion. Okay, thank you. So uh, we will now move on to items uh, three, four, and five in our public hearing. Um, these are each separate properties, but they are related. Um, and so I'll just explain the situation um, and then open it up for staff. So the, um, item number three is 1319 4th Street Southeast. Uh, item number four is 1315 4th Street Southeast. Item number five is 410 13th Avenue Southeast. These are all appeals f filed by Doran Development LLC for the decision of the Heritage Preservation Commission notwithstanding, notwithstanding staff recommendation to deny the demolition of historic resource applications um, for each of these separate three properties. And for this, we'll begin with staff from CPED. Good morning, Chair Bender, committee members. Uh, all these properties are located in Dinky Town. Uh, the two Fourth Street properties are located here, and then the um, thir uh, 410 13th Avenue Southeast property is located here, and they are separated. Um, and just for reference, uh, the 1319 building is this one story brick building. Located at 1315 4th Street is a two-story mid-century modern commercial building. And then the uh, property facing 13th Avenue is a residential structure. The applicant, uh, Dorn Companies, uh, is proposing to demolish the buildings um, to make way for a mixed-use hotel development, which would be located on those properties fronting 4th Street. Um, the property uh, that fronts 13th Avenue is also proposed to be demolished as a part of this. Uh, shown here on the site plan would be um, making way for a parking area, but the overall idea is that an e access easement would be obtained here providing access to uh, the 4th Street properties. And um, here's just the latest rendering of the proposal, but that's um, not before us today. So um, on in January, the um, HPC uh, had denied each of the demolitions um, application submitted by the applicant. Um, so um, just for the presentation, I will be, just to give you an idea, I will go through the background for Dinky Town um, and then look at each of the individual properties. Um, so starting with um, Dinky Town, um, this has been identified as a potential historic district. So the map up there shows a, a red boundary um, for properties of that area. Um, all three of the properties were identified as contributing structures to this potential district, um, which is one of the reasons why all, all three of them were thought to meet at least one of the designation criteria. Um, so Dinky Town is a commercial district uh, that has developed from, from commerce, culture, and community since the late 1800s um, because of its proximity to downtown and the University of Minnesota. In 2011, a survey was done that first identified Dinky Town as a potential historic resource. Uh, there's also a small area planning process underway for Dinky Town, and heritage preservation is one focus of that plan. Uh, the draft plan identifies the period of significance for Dinky Town as um, from 1899 to 1971. 
for the history of Dinky Town, it was well connected by the streetcar, um, which contributed to its early success, resulting in it being known as the second downtown Minneapolis. Um, there were a variety of businesses throughout its history that served the neighborhood, university, and surrounding region. Uh, this did change in the 1970s when chain storms became more prominent in the marketplace. Um, Dinky Town has also had a reputation of being a bohemian place, particularly from the late 1950s through the 70s. Um, it was also a location for protests and marches during this time. Uh, the node was uh, constructed in three distinct phases that were identified in the plan. Um, the first phase would, uh, was centered on the intersection of 4th Street and 14th, center of um, the diagram there. Um, and that phase occurred from 1900 to the 1920s. It's attributed to the streetcar primarily. Uh, the building that was uh, located at or is located at 1319 4th Street was constructed during this time. The second phase included buildings constructed in the late 1940s to 1955, um, and that was primarily along the north side of 4th Street mid block. So here. And uh, the 1315 4th Street building, actually the first part of that was constructed at that time. The last phase of construction occurred in the early 1970s, and then that built out the edges of the district. Uh, the 410 building was actually um, not in any of these phases. It preceded the construction was built in um, of the construction of the district. It was built in 1887. Uh, and just generally, the buildings within the district have undergone some alterations, um, but for the most part, it has um, this potential district has remained or retained its integrity. Um, so the um, the Dink Town itself has been identified as a candidate for local designation under Criterion 1 for its association with significant events or periods, and under Criterion 3 for containing distinctive elements of the city's identity. Uh, the 2011 study or survey that I mentioned um, identified that uh, these three properties that we're looking at were contributing properties to the district, but that they were not necessarily individually eligible for designation. Uh, that's also the case with the small area plan, uh, the information that's been included in that. These um, properties weren't uh, specifically called out in any way as having anything significantly associated with them. Um, when the, uh, the HBC what were discussing these three properties, um, the impacts of demolishing each of these um, properties that are considered contributing was a large part of their discussion. Uh, so here on the diagram, um, the blue properties are considered contributing. The orange would be those structures are not contributing. Uh, and they uh, did talk about that overall this district has retained its integrity. Um, it's easily recognizable as a district and with a large number of contributing properties. Um, they also had concerns about um, these um, having buildings within a district that aren't often individually eligible for designation but do contribute to the district. So um, they were looking at um, how three demolishing three properties here uh, would impact it um, and some uh, numbers for you to consider. 73% um, of these properties have been identified as contributing. Uh, so if three were to be demolished, that would be about 14% of the contributing structures or 10% of the total structures. Um, so uh, they are also concerned about that these demolitions would then impact the ability to designate the district both locally and nationally. Uh, so that was a large part of their discussion. And since um, the HBC acted on these demolitions, demolition applications. They did nominate Dinky Town as a historic um, district, and um, those boundaries follow the boundaries on this map, but also included the Nikki Dome. Um, they also had placed the district under interim protection, and then directed the planning director to um, prepare a designation study. Now that these, since these came in before the nomination occurred. Um, the demolitions aren't captured under that, but any new development would have to re be reviewed by the HBC. Ms. Widmeyer, uh, could you just point out once again where the buildings are in this map oh, yes. in question? Um, so this would be, oh, 
this probably isn't going to show up. This one is 13, 19, 4th Street, 13, 15, and 4, 10, 13th. Uh, moving on to the property of 13, 19, 4th Street. Um, this one had been um, kind of identified also as embodying distinctive characteristics of an architectural style. Um, so it was one of the things that was considered. It's a one-story commercial building. Um, it's constructed with four tenant spaces. Uh, since construction, the building has been used as a multi-tenant building with a variety of retail and restaurant uses. Um, some of those past uses included the Golden Gopher Cafe in Newburgh Photography Studio. Um, Although this building is located in the potential historic district and contained a variety of businesses, it doesn't appear that there were any significant events or periods um, that would qualify it as um, an individual um, designated property. Um, the architectural style is a form of vernacular commercial architecture. It features a number of characteristics of the style and the era of its construction, um, including the defined spaces for storefront signs, um, brick detailing on the parapet and facade, and transoms over the storefront windows. So here you can kind of see a close-up of one of those tenant spaces, and each of those features the sign band, um, storefront windows, and the brick detailing. This building was built by C.P. Johnson and designed by Nordstrom and Lindquist. Uh, there were no records uh, found for them that indicated any significance. Um, the original owner and of the building was John Dignan. Uh, newspaper accounts uh, indicated that he was politically active locally, that he ran for more than one political seat but was not elected. Um, he also owned a real estate business located at the property of 517 15th Avenue Southeast, so about a block, block and a half from here. Um, however, this property doesn't seem to be too significant um, for its association with him. Uh, the integrity, uh, for the integrity of the structure, um, there have been some alterations to the building. However, it does retain its integrity. Um, most of the original, materials, original exterior materials appear to remain. Um, brick is the primary material here. Um, there are some windows and doors that have been changed out. Um, as you notice, like the door here is not original. Um, more so on the rear of the property, you'll note that um, doors and windows have been filled in or changed out. Um, even with those changes, though, um, those could be uh, reversible, so that's why the integrity is pretty well kept here. Um, Looking at the condition, um, the property has stated that the structure is in need of significant repair um, and that extensive um, deferred maintenance and current, this current state of it, um, the structure has created safety hazards. Um, so they noted some of the repairs and deficiencies, um, cracked and uh, or missing brick and mortar. Um, there's a picture of one area of the building showing that. The building is an ADA compliant. Um, there's outdated mechanical and electrical systems. Um, crumbling asphalt with large potholes in the parking lot, a lack of a stormwater management system, um, and then regrading of the parking lot would also be needed for proper drainage. Um, for the structure itself, the applicant um, did not submit a structural condition assessment. Um, some of the conditions noted aren't too uncommon for buildings of this age and construction type. Um, so just for um, reference on the value of what we could find was that Hennepin County uh, noted that the building value is uh, just over a quarter of a million and the land value is over half a million. Um, so we did recognize that there are repairs needed, but uh, demolition might not be the only option here. Um, one other thing that the applicant did note that this um, building isn't the highest and best use of the site because it does take up only a small portion of it. Um, they also can't build on top of it to incorporate it into the development. Uh, but ultimately, um, for the staff recommendation, when we were looking at this individual property, we didn't find it to be significant under our local criteria and did recommend approval of the demolition. Um, the, the HPC, as I mentioned, um, had a large discussion about the impact on the district. Uh, so they did unanimously vote to um, deny the demolition and place, uh, place it under interim protection. So a designation study could be pursued. Are there any questions on this one? Others I'll move on. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, so the next one would be the one located at 1315 4th Street. Uh, there's uh, some associations with this to master architect, and it does have um, distinctive characteristics of an architectural style. Uh, it's a two-story commercial building. Um, it was originally constructed as a one-story office building, uh, and later a second addition was added in 1961. Uh, the, the second story, as you know, is wider than the first story. There's this driveway that goes underneath. Um, and that's to retain access to the rear of the property, which has a parking area, uh, it doesn't have, as it doesn't have access to a public alley. Mm -hmm. um, the original owner of the building was C.B. Christensen, which is a real estate company, and they did occupy office space in this building. Um, another use that had a long-term residency in here was a bank branch, Marquette Bank. Um, but now those uses are gone, and we have other commercial uses in the building. For the architectural style, this building is a form of mid-century modern commercial architecture. Um, it does have a number of characteristics of the style, uh, which include the lack of ornament, um, emphasis on rectangu rectangular forms in horizontal and vertical lines, uh, and it does use modern materials and systems, um, mainly the concrete here. It's a simple style of or simple style of post for buildings like this one. Um, represent a departure from um, some of the earlier styles of architecture, more decorative styles, um, and it does focus more on accessibility and customer service. Uh, I mentioned the driveway that goes under the building. Um, and that was purposely done to provide um, more convenient access to that parking area, um, but we didn't find that this was an early example of a building designed to accommodate the automobile. Um, for example, there um, are other buildings around the country that have drive through windows that were in use since the 1930s. And uh, as this was first constructed in 1955, it's quite a bit of time later. Um, so we found that the property doesn't embody any distinctive characteristics of an engineering type of style or method of construction as well. The, um, the original one-story office building um, was constructed in 1955 and designed by McClure and Kerr. Um, the second story that was added six years later was designed by Kerr Johnson. Um, these architects were notable Minnesota architects, um, but this property doesn't exemplify their work. Uh, just some background on the architects. Frank Kerr was involved in the design of both construction phases of this project. Um, his architectural career spanned from 1946 into the 1990s and it did include both residential and commercial design. Uh, when the original part of the building was constructed, he was a partner with Harlan McClure, um, and that partnership only lasted three years from 1952 to 1955. The Cure Johnson um, partnership with, that was a partnership with Harley Johnson, um, was the architect of record for the second edition, and that partnership ended in 1962. So the, um, for, Kerr, this building was not um, a building that exemplified his work. There's a better example in St. Paul. Um, he designed the Grace Lutheran Church over there. Um, same thing with Harlan McClure and Harley Johnson's work. These, this one just doesn't exemplify their work. Um, we also didn't find any um, evidence of there being any significant events or periods. Um, that were associated with this specific property uh, doesn't, um, again, doesn't appear to be significant for its association with the lives of significant persons. Um, the construction company, Central Construction Company, and uh, the realtor that um, occupied the building uh, didn't have any records that came up showing that they were significant. Um, looking at the integrity of the building, um, it does retains certain aspects of integrity, um, but much of it has also been impaired. Uh, the University of Minnesota Nor uh, Northwest Architectural Archives, ha Archives has Frank Hare drawings um, for this property, so I was able to look at what those drawings showed and uh, what's currently on the site. Fortunately, we don't have any pictures um, that would confirm what was shown in the drawings was actually built on the site, um, but I'll just run through some of the differences that were noted. These storefront windows in this area were actually recessed um, along with the entrance. And now these are right on the um, front lot line. The uh, plans had shown that mosaic tile was installed where these um, wood paneling segments of the wall 
on the front and uh, back of the building are currently located. Um, this area at the front of the building where the ATM is now located was open for the driveway, so there was an infill addition there at one time. Uh, there's windows and doors here that have changed at facing the driveway. <clears throat> They're also on the back of the building. This uh, stairway used to be um, open to the elements. Now it's been covered and enclosed, along with a number of windows. which used to be a storefront window system here. has all been covered. And windows have also been covered over the driveway segment of the second floor of the building. So those are the main differences noted. Um, so we did think that was a significant impact on integrity. Um, looking at the condition, however, it doesn't seem to be in too poor of condition. Uh, the, again, the applicant stated that this isn't the highest and best use of the site. Um, again, incorporating it into the development uh, wouldn't be fe feasible. Just looking at the property value based on Hennepin County records, um, the building has a value of 80000 Dollars and a land value of over half a million. <clears throat> the applicant did ident identify some costs that would need to be incurred in reusing the building, which including um, adding a stormwater management system, grading the, uh, the site for proper drainage, and making the building fully accessible. Um, again, with this one, we for the staff rec recommendation, we did um, conclude that it wasn't eligible under the local criteria and recommended approval. The HPC on this one, again, denied it based largely on um, the impact to the district, but um, they did also note, um, some of the commissioners did note that the period of significance identified by the small area plan is rather long, um, and this was constructed towards the end of that period. Um, so the vote ultimately ended up being seven to two. And lastly, we have the residents at 410 13th Avenue Southeast. Um, this one was mainly just included because it was a potential, identified as a contributing structure in the potential district. Um, this structure was um, constructed in 1887 by C.E. Rogers. It's one of the oldest remaining structures in Dinky Town. The architect designer is unknown, um, and there are no records found for the building, uh, builder significating uh, significance. The style is vernacular cottage. Um, as you can see, it's clad in uh, wood lap siding with a stone foundation. Um, some of the remaining architectural details include paired scroll work eave brackets along the roof and Greek revival style eave cornices. Um, some of the original windows do remain, um, but it has undergone some alterations. Um, this porch is not original. Um, it was. Uh, replaced in 1983, and it's a third the size of the original porch. And also, you can see here there's an accessible ramp that was added, also not original. Um, so there have been alterations for, for the most part. It does retain its integrity. The condition of it um, does need repairs. Um, the applicant has noted some of the issues, including uh, trees growing from the foundation, some crumbling of the foundation. Um, also, the uh, exterior needs to be painted, and so just some maintenance work on the exterior. For this one, a structural condition assessment also was not submitted. Um, we didn't find that these repairs that were needed were all that uncommon with a, a home of this um, age either, uh, or as well. Uh, again, for the economic value, um, we looked at Hennepin County uh, records, and that showed that the land value was 120000 The building value was $12,000. So the applicant did contend that the cost of repairs would far exceed the value of the building. Um, but basically what it came down again for the staff recommendation was that this didn't meet the, uh, the criteria for local designation as an individual property. Um, so we did recommend approval. But as I mentioned, the HPC was looking at the effect of the potential district. So um, they also point out they did have um, talk about how this as a residential structure would relate to 
a commercial district and its importance for that. Um, but ultimately, they just decided to deny, deny it so the study could proceed to make that determination. I can take any questions. Great, thank you. Um, just because there are a lot of moving pieces here with uh, different applications and studies, uh, I'd like to ask our city attorney's office, Mr. Nielsen, to sort of clarify the legal context here with um, a small area plan in place that has not been adopted, the um, HPC's nomination of the district, as well as these three individual permits, um, so how those all fit together, and how the, particularly the district uh, nomination plays into this decision here today. Sure. Uh, Chair Bender, um, the city's HPC regulations allow a property or district to be nominated for study at any point whatsoever. There's various entities in the ordinance that are allowed to, to uh, do a nomination. Um, so this particular district nomination could have occurred at any point in the past, six months ago, one year ago, five years ago, ten years ago. Um, for whatever reason, it did not occur until February 4th of this year. And uh, the, the applicants demolition applications preceded the effective date for that nomination, the effective date for interim protection associated with that nomination. And so they are not captured by the district nomination. Uh, so your uh, task today, um, and, and should note that the way that um, the timing of those applications is key is because uh, interim protection imposed in conjunction with a historic designation study is roughly equivalent to the way uh, a moratorium is imposed to protect a zoning study or a planning study. And the timing of applications, that the way we handle those applications with a moratorium is exactly the same way. If an application precedes the effective date of a moratorium, um, then it is not captured by that moratorium. Now there are ways to get a waiver from the moratorium, just as here, when something is under interim protection, it doesn't freeze everything. Somebody can still ask to do something to the property. You just have to submit a certain type of application, receive permission from the HPC to do so. So your task today is to evaluate these three individual demolition applications according to the standard in 599.480 with regard to historic resources. And um, just to give you a quick background on that, your initial decision, therefore, is, is whether these properties are historic resources. That definition is property that is believed to have historical, cultural, architectural, archaeological, or engineering significance and to meet at least one of the criteria for designation as a landmark or historic district as provided in this chapter. You're not making the final call on the historic merit of these properties now. This is an initial phase. The final call on the historic merit of a property is not made until after a study is conducted sometime down the road. That decision will come to you. Um, regardless of your decision today on these applications, the district study will continue. That's going to go on. That's going to happen no matter what. Also, the new construction, the hotel proposal here, uh, um, as everybody knows, they, the developer has yet to submit the applications for that, the, the zoning applications for that project. And so there are several more steps of review yet to come. The zoning applications will go to the planning commission for decisions. At this point, it looks like it involves a rezoning, uh, a couple variances, a conditional use permit to increase height. Um, the rezoning is going to come to the council no matter what. That's a legislative decision, ultimately. If any of the, the other associated applications are appealed from the Planning Commission, those will also come to the council. And then the new construction proposal also will have to undergo review by the HPC because that application is captured by the district nomination. So there are, I should note there are several steps yet to come. The debate today isn't on the merits of a hotel proposal, per se. It's on the merits of these three individual properties. And so... If you determine that the, prop the, the properties are not historic resources, the code dictates that the demolition is, it, you, you, have, you have to approve the demolition. If you determine that they are historic resources, you can order the designation study um, and uphold um, uh, the, or, the interim protection for the individual properties on that basis. Um, however, even if you determine that they are historic resources, the code does allow you to still approve a demolition if the applicant who bears the burden of proof on this on these issues? If the applicant proves to you with sufficient evidence uh, that the existence of an unsafe or dangerous condition on the property, or that there are no reasonable alternatives to demolition, it's a high bar in that regard. So your your first task is to make the decision on whether these are historic resources or not. Thank you, Mr. Nielsen. Are there any other questions, Council Member Andrew Johnson? Thank you, Madam Chair. I was curious from staff uh, in 
particular to the property 1319 4th Street Southeast. How many other buildings are like this within the city that have the same kind of brickwork? Uh, and and what are their relative conditions compared to this property? Chair Bender, uh, Councilmember Johnson, that research has not been done, so we don't have that information available at this time. Um, certainly this is not the only commercial node in the city with um, buildings similar to it. Thank you. Are there any other questions for staff? Okay, seeing none, I will open the public hearing. I know there are, are a lot of people here who want to speak, and I want to make sure everyone's voices are heard. Uh, I would ask that folks um, please register with the clerk, and when you speak, state your name and address for the record. I want to try to keep the f conversation today focused on the question at hand as described by our city attorney's office, which is the uh, demolition of these buildings and not the proposal for development, which will come back through our process and significant process if it does go forward. Um, so there will be ample opportunity to comment on the merits and questions about any proposal for development on this site. Uh, so today's hearing is really to talk about the uh, historic um, preservation qualities of these three individual buildings. Um, so uh, please, um, I'd ask the uh, applicant to please um, come forward first. Good morning, Chair Bender, Council Members. I'm Ann Barrett, General Counsel for Doran, and I will try to um, keep my comments relatively brief and not repeat what's already been said by staff. Uh, as you know, your determination today is three separate appeals that we filed based on uh, denial by the HPC of demolition permits for properties in Dinky Town. And there really is a single question before you, and that is, for each one of these properties, is the particular property an historic resource? Um, now, as, as Attorney Nielsen said, there's a two-part test in the ordinance for making that determination. First, you have to ask whether the property has historic, cultural, archaeological, architectural, or engineering significance, and the property must also meet at least one of the designation criteria that's outlined in the code. Now, this all three of these properties were researched extensively by staff, and staff got it right in their recommendation that the demolition permits be approved. There's absolutely no facts that indicate that any of these properties have any particular significance. They're not historic resources under the code. At the HPC hearing, the commissioners really focused more on Dinkytown as a whole. And they asked the question, what should the future of Dinkytown be? Um, is Dinkytown as a neighborhood historically significant? And as you've heard, um, those are not the questions before you today. At that hearing, and I'm, I'm sure you'll also hear from people today, uh, there were a number of, of people speaking in opposition to this project, and their argument is that these particular properties are really integral to the whole fabric of Dinkytown, and that the demolition will somehow destroy the energy or the character of Dinkytown as a whole. We fundamentally disagree that the vibrancy and character of Dinky Town are tied to these physical structures. I think what everyone agrees on is that Dinky Town is unique and that there's an energy worth preserving and what the disagreement is is how you go about achieving that. Dinky Town, as we see it, is in a deteriorating state. This project takes a property that currently is 75% surface parking lot and redevelops it and returns a use to Dinky Town, a hotel that existed across the street for more than 50 years. This is an activity center. This is completely consistent with the city's comprehensive plan and the goals of promoting growth and quality redevelopment in the city. But as I said, what we're here to discuss today are the demo, demo applications for these particular properties. And the HPC's task, which they which they fail to do, and your duty today is to determine whether these properties standing alone are historic resources. Now, Ms. Woodmeyer addressed each of the properties in detail, so I won't um, reiterate what she said, but I think the points that she made are clear. Each one of these properties was built at a time to serve a specific function, um, and it, each of the buildings have served their purpose. There were no significant events, people, or any other facts 
uh, that would justify denying the demol demolition applications for these properties. Now, there are multiple other uh, bases for overturning the HPC's decision, and we went into detail on all of those in our written submissions. I want to just highlight a couple points for you today. The term historic resource, um, both the definition in the code and its application by the HPC were unconstitutional in this case. It's a vague definition. It's based on subjective criteria. And as the record of the HPC hearing indicates, the commissioners did just that. They used their subjective beliefs to make a determination about whether or not our demolition application should be approved or denied um, without relying on objective criteria contained in the code. Second, the process for determining who needs to go before the HPC in the, in the first place is flawed. As we indicated um, in our submissions, there was a report submitted to the City Council last year that just gives a snapshot of properties that were approved administratively for demolition. These properties are no different than many of those other properties. There were commercial and residential buildings uh, that were approved. There were two houses on Fifth Street on the same square block that were older than this uh, residential house that's the subject of your determination today that were administratively approved. And so there really isn't any reason for our applications to be treated any differently. And lastly, establishing interim protection is not permitted under the code until there's been a nomination. And as you heard, there was no nomination at the time that we submitted these applications. So that uh, determination by the HPC is incorrect. There should be no interim protection established for these properties at this point. Now, the last point that I want to make is I think there's a, there, I know there's a lot of emotion associated with this project, with our applications. But I think what might be getting missed in this discussion is that while there is vocal opposition to this project, there's also broad support. We reached out to all 27 property owners in the four square block area on 4th and 14th and asked them to sign a resolution supporting this project. And of those 27 property owners, we have 19 people who have signed that petition and eight who have either declined to take a position or have not responded. And we have that um, petition here for you today. So we think that this project will be a significant resource for the University of Minnesota and the community. Uh, the project, as you know, will contain a commercial space. There are existing commercial tenants in the buildings um, that exist at the properties today. We have an obligation to honor those leases and we will continue to work with those tenants. Um, but we think overall, this is a positive for the area. We think the HPC was absolutely wrong in their denial of our demolition applications. The properties are not historic resources, and so we ask that you overturn the HPC decisions today. Now I'm happy to answer any questions, and I'd also like to reserve the right to respond um, at the end to any comments that are raised in the public hearing. Thank you. Are there any questions for the applicant? Seeing none, I'll ask if uh, anyone else would like to speak. I know that we have a lot of people here. I'll ask you to each keep your statements to three minutes um, in order to make sure that everyone has a chance to speak and that the committee has a chance to go into the details of this important decision today. My name is Cordelia Pearson. I'm president of the Marcy Homes Neighbor Association, and I do have a presentation. I just need some help in figuring out how to activate it. Chair Bender and members of the committee, my name is Cordelia Pearson, I'm President of Marcy Homes Neighbor Association. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. The theme I'd like to respond to, if there's one single thing, it's growing with preservation. We want our city to grow. We want it to grow 100,000 people in the next few years. We are prepared to do that. 
while we protect the quality of the places that we have, the quality of the places that attract that growth. Briefly, Marcy Holmes's identity is critically tied into the identity of Dinkytown. That is one of the findings before you. Is Dinkytown and are these properties associated with something that is uh, key to the identity of the neighborhood? So I want to start with that. The reason I'm providing a PowerPoint is that photos and visuals tell a lot of the story here instead of just words. Our neighborhood is right between the two stadiums. It's on the Mississippi River between downtown and the, Miss and, uh, the university. Um, we are, our brand our, on our signs is historic neighborhood. Uh, we are the commercial, Dinkytown is the commercial node closest to the university, historic area. So the knoll, when you think of where the university began, this was a commercial area that was closest to the start of the university. We're very friendly for biking and walking. You look at ped and bike figures and we're off the charts and we'd like to make that safer for people. On transit though, we're not on the grid. Uh, LRT is bypassing this area, which makes the bike walk environment particularly important and makes us particularly intent attentive to where we want to embrace and welcome development. We have uh, some real challenges with uh, cars crossing sidewalks in this area and we need to address pedestrian safety and that is certainly one of the things we're looking at in this area. We've welcomed growth. In the past three years alone, we've had 2,300 approved units. 830 have been built, 1,844 have been proposed. That's huge growth. So we are embracing growth. Um, you'll see the chart on the side, and I apologize that these are difficult to read. They're in our master plan update draft. So I'll address the next three things together, the property significance, the district character, and the designation study. The property significance, each of these supports thriving small businesses, has for years. They're pedestrian friendly. The materials, the brick and concrete are consistent with the area. The historic use is consistent with the use today. And they are adjacent to the site where the Dinkytown Post Office is today. That was the site of the Red Barn protest. And it really symbolized a community rising up to say, we want to have a say in how our community is shaped in the future. It's a very strong symbol of Dinkytown, of community engagement, and of how community members can make a difference in shaping the future of their community. Here are some examples of the brick um, facing it, and I particularly want to draw your attention to the Dinky Dale project right across the street from the subject properties. The subject properties are on the bottom, um, and that is what it faces. The Varsity Theater and the Dinky Dale are the buildings that are uh, immediately helping shape that streetscape of these, these projects. 21 contributing buildings, uh, these are three of them, and they are unusually intact and have uh, as, as you've heard from staff earlier, um, the, I think you probably can see where those buildings are located right now. I want to address briefly the appellant's points about the standard of review. The standard of review of the, the Heritage Preservation Commission is did they act arbitrarily and capriciously? You, that's a very high standard for the appellant to meet. Um, the standard of finding that these are historic um, is something the HPC and that has gone all the way up to the Supreme Court of Minnesota in terms of upholding the HPC's authority and process. The um, fact that these uh, buildings by themselves might not stand out as the particular iconic structure in Dinkytown is not determinative. If you look at Milwaukee Avenue Historic District, many of those individual buildings, even in the historic domination, were pointed out that they by themselves would not be historic buildings, but that they are part of a contributing fabric of histor a historic district. Similarly, a historic district is made up of parts. You take out part of those parts, you don't necessarily have the whole anymore. Um, the ordinance has been found to be reasonable. To have interim protection is an entirely reasonable thing within the city's discretion. The designation study. Yes, that could have been requested by a prior city council member. We're happy to have had an election. Finally, growing with preservation. Public engagement has been vigorous and strong. Since 2011, uh, the city did initiate a uh, planning process with Intermedia Arts. The real focus was how do we protect and preserve areas as we grow? There was substantial community engagement and involvement in this in a very positive way. 
And two very key things came of this. The historic research largely completed the work that would need to be done for a designation study. So most of that designation study will be completed quickly, I trust. The second very key element is the economic study and the growth. We embrace growth of Dinky Town. This map represents the surrounding blocks that are, we welcome for expanding growth. The hash mark areas are those, uh, the, existing, um, the existing activity center, which has C1 zoning, very low density zoning right now, which is consistent with this pedestrian scale development. There are several distinct markets that Dinky Town draws. Th those that uh, come from a distance really identify some certain aspects of Dinky Town that are specific to those buildings and not just to the, um, the particular uh, people that might be there. Um, the economic study spoke out very clearly. Dinky Town's older character is going to be an increasingly important differ differentiator. Without this historic character, Dinky Town will definitely decline. Those were the findings of the economists, and those also are the uh, strong sentiments of the neighborhood as well. So in closing, I urge you to think about growing with preservation, to think about placemaking and maintaining the identity of the place. This designation study will provide clarity for investment, invite investment in the area, and we hope that you choose to protect these properties to allow choices for you in the future to draw investment into this area. Thank you, and I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? All right. Thank you. So um, uh, thank you, Ms. Pearson. So I, I want to open up a uh, comment for others. I want to uh, just reiterate um, to please keep your comments to three minutes. Uh, we've gotten a lot of context from the Neighborhood Association, which I thought was important. But from now going forward, please keep your comments focused on the matter that's in front of the co uh, committee today, which is the historic uh, nature of these three properties. And, um, and then I'll just open it up for um, your comment. Hi, I'm Mike Mulroney. I own Blarney Pub and Grill at 412 14th Avenue uh, in Dinky Town. And I'll keep it, I have a lot of points, but I'm going to keep it right to these buildings and the other buildings in the area. And this is where I think that the commission erred. And they're, they're assuming that these buildings are, all the buildings as a whole should designate whether this is a historic area or not. And I think on that very last presentation she put there, one of their concerns was nostalgic brand. And that's great. Nostalgic brand is important, but I don't think that it should ever be confused with history because it's not history. It's nostalgia and it's memories. And that will continue and that will be preserved no matter what happens. In these pictures and in these discussions of the buildings that need to be preserved, one of those that they say needs to be preserved because it's historic is the building that I'm located in. Ten years ago, I remodeled that building. I was the one out on scaffolding, pounding in the nails and hitting the, hitting the signs in and, and repainting it. As much as I'm flattered by somebody saying that that's historic, it's not historic because I'm not historic. Uh, these buildings have gone through incredible change over the years and, and that's taken away some of what it was when it was built in 1955, which I would argue is probably not historic as well. Um, I think the Fauché Tower is historic. I think this building that we're in right now is a historic building. But just because those are historic doesn't automatically qualify the building across the street as being hist historic as well. There are some buildings that have architectural value in Dickey Town that could be classified as that's history, but these aren't. These are plain, small, one-story buildings that can't support any more work to be done on them or additional building or building on top of them, which limits what will happen. As we talk about the economic value and the, the supposed, as was just presented, decline of Dinky Town if something changes, I disagree with that. I've been a thriving business in Dinky Town for 10 years and much more thriving than the businesses that were there prior to me. Uh, so I don't believe that changing the area and changing the building structures and the designs of Dinky Town is going to create the decline of Dinky Town. I think it's only going to improve it and it's going to help the economic value, which is the long-range vision of the city. Um, that being said, I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to speak? Uh, 
Good morning, members of the council. <clears throat> good, good morning, uh, uh, Chairman Bender, Chairperson Bender. My name is Bob Roscoe. Uh, my address is 1401 East River Parkway. <clears throat> I served on Minneapolis HPC for 21 years, <clears throat> so I've had some experience, including the kind of experience. One of the patterns of preservation seems to be that people who want to doubt preservation want to uh, find ways of not understanding its real context, and, and there's a fear factor of what, of what they don't know. This is one of, as one said, this is the, one of the few commercial uh, unique areas in, min, in Minneapolis because of a small character. <clears throat> I know that from my, my university days when I came here in 1960, uh, I was just a month uh, at the university when I all of a sudden realized, walking down <clears throat> 4th Street, that I should go into the School of Architecture. And what influenced me? Um, <clears throat> and that, that decision has really uh, rewarded me beyond measure. But the historic <clears throat> character of Dinkytown is now threatened by significant changes <clears throat> that would vitiate this, its wonderful ambience. As Cordelia said, nobody wants to prevent change. A freeze-dried freeze -dried history would prevent changes that businesses need to grow. That's why Dinkytown has renewed itself in the years since 1960 when I first uh, <coughs> saw it. Um, it was, seemed like a magical place in those first years. Uh, some years later, I uh, made <coughs> my home aboard an aircraft carrier. When I came back in 1965, uh, my friends were saying, uh, Dinky Town is, is, is in the past. The West Bank is where it's at. And so I thought, great. I spent a lot of time in the West Bank, spent, spent a lot of money in the West Bank, forgot about Dinky Town. Well, that was, lasted about 15 years. Dinky Town <clears throat> is the prime place with, connected to the university and the city of Minneapolis. <clears throat> I think that given the St. Anthony Falls Historic District, <clears throat> the Marcy Holmes Historic District, the Knoll District that was just mentioned, and the, pro and the possibility of a, of a preservation-based conservation district in Prospect Park, that giving Dinkytown historic designation would be a history, historic necklace that the city of Minneapolis greatly deserves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Could you make sure to get a copy to the clerk, please? Been, Perfect. The, the Thank clerk you. already has copies of it for you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Doug Donnelly, and I'm pastor of University Baptist Church, which is at 1219 University Avenue, just outside of the, the business district, but uh, in just a stone's throw from this area. I'm not going to read this entire thing because a lot of it has already been repeated, but I want you to know that, we, that our congregation has been in Dinkytown since 1890, and, uh, and we're property owners. And we're longtime members of the Dinkytown community who are concerned about recent and future developments um, and how they affect the eclectic nature of the neighborhood that we know and love. We house five congregations in our building and several community groups, um, all of whom um, that, that visit and, and work in Dinkytown patronize, patronize the wonderful small businesses that are in the Dinkytown area. We love the idea that there are small businesses family-owned businesses that, that can thrive in a small footprint. Um, one of the things that has really affected our congregation in the, in the, uh, in the past year especially has been the, uh, the disappearance of 400 spaces, over 400 spaces of parking that has uh, um, gone away where, where the UTEC development and the Opus developments are just very close to, the, uh, to this other proposed development. The, um, the one remaining public parking lot um, in, in Dinkytown is behind one of the buildings that is, that is being proposed to be demolished. And so that is a significant um, uh, burden on our congregation, especially when we've got lots of older people who, are, who have uh, significant mobility issues. Um, I spent the be better part of the past year on the um, small area plan uh, task force on behalf of the congregation where we went with, uh, with several business owners and property owners and neighborhood activists, uh, all very uh, passionately concerned about 
about preserving Dinky Town and, and helping it to grow and thrive in the future. The 1319 building in particular uh, displays a uh, unique uh, 1920s architecture which is concomitant with our building, also built right around that same time. Um, as interested and responsible property owners, uh, University Baptist Church Council voted on Sunday, January 19th to oppose the demolition of the, of the buildings in question. This is because the demolition of, and the proposed new development exacerbate a parking problem already at epidemic in Dinky Town. We're completely behind responsible development that takes into account the needs of the neighbors, including parking and opportunities for small businesses to grow and thrive. We believe the Heritage Preservation Commission made a wise decision to deny the demolition permits at this time. Please respect their work and the work of the neighborhood and business and property owners who continue to work on the small area plan. We urge you to, de we urge you to deny the appeal and let this small area plan be allowed to make its recommendations. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? Good morning, Council Member Bender. My name is William Wells. Uh, my address is 2832 Fremont Avenue South in Minneapolis. I am an architect. I am an alumni of the University of Minnesota. I used to live in the Marcy Holmes neighborhood, and I've currently designed a handful of buildings under construction in the area. I regularly attend all the planning meetings and a lot of the neighborhood meetings. I'm very familiar with the issues, and I just wanted to give some perspective. I've also met with all the 18 property owners in the Dinky Town business area. Uh, we have this morning two different stakeholder groups that are obviously moving in two very different directions for the Dinky Town area. The U of M area is a very unique area for the node of the city. It has tremendous demand for people that want to live in Dinky Town, people that want to own a business in Dinky Town. It's been identified uh, by city staff as a growth center for the city, and city staff has recommended um, demolition of the uh, application in front of you today. Developers and business owners and property owners are responding to the demand and growth for change in Dinky Town by providing new buildings. We have another stakeholder group today uh, represented by a small group of homeowners that do not want change in Dinky Town and are, have requested a moratorium to stop all demolition. This is very concerning. We have two different stakeholder groups moving in opposite directions, and unfortunately, many of the property owners in Dinky Town have been rejected from the neighborhood association and are not participating in the small area plan. That is very concerning that I wanted to bring that uh, point forefront to you today. Most of the property owners in Dinky Town do support the application today for demolition. Uh, just briefly, I, I would ask the committee today to try to find a reasonable solution that uh, both parties could work together on. I support the demolition of 410 13th Avenue Southeast. I think that's reasonable. That house is not contributing to the commercial district of the area. Perhaps uh, regarding 1319 4th Street and 1315 4th Street, what we see as historic is only the scale and materials of those buildings and not the actual buildings themselves. So perhaps the applicant could work with city staff in the design of the new building to replace the scale and materiality of that commercial node. That is something to consider going forward. Uh, thank you for listening to my comments. Thank you. Are there others who wish to speak? Good morning, Chair Bender and uh, committee members. My name is Antigone Sander McLeod, and I am the Vice President of the Dinky Town Business Association, as well as owner of Restaurant Cafe 421 in Dinky Town at 421 14th Avenue Southeast. And in regards to the properties that we're speaking of specifically today, um, they are important, I believe, to the significant historical value of our neighborhood. Um, the corner of 14th and 4th is a historical crossroads for people, and we have heard here today already that nostalgia can be you know, based on when you are in a place and when you're not there. However, owning a business where I do, daily we have people coming into our restaurant saying, what was here 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago? that has value to the economic significance of 
uh, our businesses. We have alums of the university who come regularly to support the places that they used to go to and the new businesses that are in those places. So maintaining the vitality of the economics of our businesses is crucial in keeping that historical crossroads um, intact. And I also just wish to let you know that we, I specifically do support the voice that Marcy Holmes has um, offered here today, and I do only speak for my business, and I can't speak for the entire DBA. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Madam Chair, Council Members, uh, my name is Paul Buchanan. I'm a board member for the neighborhood for Marcy Holmes Neighbor Association, uh, where I've lived for the last uh, eight years in and around the university area. I'm a graduate of the university. Um, there, there, so far, there has been no request for a moratorium in this area. Uh, the Neighborhood Association is encouraging of, we're, we're, we're encouraging of smart growth, of considerate growth. Uh, we have been working on our revised master plan for the last uh, two and a half years nearly now. Um, and the master plan does, the, cur the new master plan does outline areas for growth within the neighborhood, specifically within uh, the Dinky Town context uh, to expand Dinky Town, to expand the uh, commercial node that is Dinky Town. Um, in terms of the historic context of these buildings, um, Cordelia said it well in that it's not you know one building that is historic. Um, I completely agree with Michael here. It's not one building that's historic. It's the fabric of Dinky Town that is historic, that contributes to um, the identity of our neighborhood, ultimately the identity of our city. How many students that go through the university create their identity from the city, uh, create their identity within the city, within the university, uh, through their um, experiences in Dinky Town, experiences at places like Mesa Pizza, places like Blarney's. Um, places like the University uh, Life Center that is housed in the 1315 building. Um, and so it's, it's, it is beyond, the, the history of a building is not locked within its four walls, but it, is, it expands beyond that too, as Cordelia and as I said before, the, uh, the fabric of the, of the area, the threads that these buildings contribute to that fabric. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? And can I get a sense of how many more people wish to speak? Great. Okay. Uh, come on up. Hi, I'm Paul DeZubnar, and I'm the building owner of 411 14th Avenue Southeast, which um, houses Al's and also Express Royale and five apartments upstairs, and it's right in the middle of 14th Street. And I guess I'd just like to support... Uh, the thought that I believe that Dinky Town and what it is and what it was uh, stems from the community that's around it, the, the present physical presence of the university, its students, the neighbors, and uh, the people that operate the business, not necessarily the buildings themselves. And so um, although there's a lot of history behind Dinky Town that people are talking about from a nostalgic standpoint, I believe that stems from uh, similar things that the owner of Blarney said, that it's it's the people in the in the community, and so specific to these three buildings, um, I support the demolition of these buildings because I think that Dinky Town won't change when uh, those buildings are gone. I think it will continue just like it has. It, the buildings and things in Dinky Town have changed for years, especially during the period that was outlined by the city, and Dinky Town has never lost its vibrancy through those changes, and I don't think going forward it will lose its vibrancy again. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Holly Hiltonen, and I live at 11725 Red Fox Drive in Maple Grove. I am here today representing my mother, Meredith Nordstrom, who is the owner and lives at 410 13th Avenue Southeast. Uh, my mother's house is one of the uh, buildings being discussed today. Unfortunately, my mother could not attend to this meeting today due to a health issue and has asked me to speak on her behalf. 
I appreciate the opportunity to do so. I'm sorry, I'm not used to public speaking, so I hope you won't mind if I read from my notes. Uh, first, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about my mother. Um, my mother is 81 years old and has lived in her house for over 60 years. Before that, my grandparents owned the house, buying it in, I believe, at least my mother has told me, 1946. So this house has been in our family for almost 70 years. My mother has enjoyed living in Dinkytown all of her life. And um, she has been very active. She has been a very active and in independent woman, getting about town and thoroughly enjoying everything about the city, in particular, everything that the city and Dinkytown has to offer. She loves the university and has many happy memories living in the area. In the last uh, few years, however, she has experienced some serious health issues and finds her home life more difficult now for someone her age. She would like to move to a living arrangement that is both easier and simpler but the money to fund that transition has been hard for her to come by. Now, the Doran Company has offered her the opportunity to sell her home for a good price that would enable her to have that safer, more manageable life in her senior years, allowing her the freedom to move and providing her the resources to see her through. My mother, um, believes in the importance of a safe, vibrant, and welcoming dinky town and would never do anything to negatively impact her beloved neighborhood. She truly believes this proposed hotel project would ultimately help the area grow and thrive. That said, her concerns are much more personal. She is upset at these attempts to take away her right to sell her own home for a price that she deems fair. Hurt that anyone would deny a senior citizen her independence to make these decisions and her dignity. And she is afraid of what the future holds for her if this opportunity disappears. This sale means a lot, not just for Dinky Town, but for my mother. For her, it means a chance to move forward in life. Uh, thank you for granting me the opportunity to speak on behalf of my mother. Thank you very much. Uh, could the next person come forward? Hi, I'm Cowie McCormick. I live at 615 Fulton Street Southeast, dorm room number S276. And uh, just looking around through this, there hasn't been too much student opinion when, in my opinion, it's a pretty hefty majority of who's living there, and I can't give you an exact answer of every student that's on the university, but I've talked to a lot of people about it, and the general consensus that I've seen from students that are currently there is that <clears throat> their memories of Dinky Town aren't necessarily associated with the physical building, rather than the smaller businesses that are actually there and more of the, the activities that go on there. So. I just wanted to make sure that there's some sort of student voice here in terms of what I've personally heard is that the physical buildings to the current students are not as important as actually what happens downtown. So I just wanted to make sure that there was a, a student voice heard during this process. Thank you. Uh, is, would the next person please come forward to speak? Thank you. Um, I'm Kristen Eide Tollefson, and I'm the um, owner of the book house in Dinkytown. And I was on the small area planning process, and I've been in Dinkytown 37 years, so I've heard lots of student voices, lots of alum voices, and um, the importance of Dinkytown as a physical entity, the continuity of the structures, and the continuity of the business, small businesses that are there. I am. Um, was part of the small area planning process, which um, was not really very accurately represented previously. Um, and I won't take your time now to uh, amend that, but I want to give you a few slides from that plan. I, um, Anybody know how to do that? Oh, thanks, Janelle. 
pretty trying to go through the top. This right one, now. yeah. Shit. Okay. Um, well, these buildings, I wanted to, to um, give uh, Commissioner uh, Johnson a little better view of some of the rest of the buildings in Dinky Town. that the character of the building that's in question at 1319 is um, one, one that is uh, important because of the continuity that creates, particularly at that vital intersection that's considered the core of Dinky Town. And specifically, I'm going to have to do practice here. And specifically, the building in question right here uh, is referenced, thank you, is referenced in the small area plan um, as a contributing historic structure. My understanding is that historic resource definition in the code includes um, a historic districts um, and contributing to historic districts. Uh, the quote from the plan from the historic consultant's report is that there are many other historic structures that contribute to the character of Dinky Town, low scale, one story buildings such as 1319, 1325 4th Street Southeast, which is the one in question there. These are equally important to the historic value of Dinky Town and help provide the pedestrian scale that is typical of the district, all play an integral part in forming the unique fabric and historic feeling that Dinky Town possesses. The historic uh, report from the small area plan draft summarizes that Dinky Town fits the criteria of all potential historic district designations at the local and national levels due to its intact historic character significance and well-preserved structures. And the first um, recommendation of the heritage preservation section of the draft is that uh, this clear this commercial district be uh, clearly um, established to enable the city and the neighborhood and the business district to consider practices to preserve the remaining historic architectural and cultural values of the area. The core commercial district centers around the intersection to which the structure at 1319 and secondarily 1315 significantly contribute. And the final uh, citation that I'd like to make from the um, small area planning draft comes directly from the uh, market analysis that was done as a separate consultancy, um, which says, if there's no regulatory control to preserve the existing stock of older buildings, many will likely be torn down in a relatively rapid rate given market forces. Dinky Town is a very small district, and it will not take too many teardowns of key sites to permanently alter the character of the district. It is the, let's see, it would, let's see. Such um, teardowns would remove the critical mass of these character locations. And if this were to be the case, Dinky Town would cease to function as a character district and instead be a retail location with a few isolated old buildings. I want to close with a, um, a, a story. When I moved my bookstore this summer, uh, I had book dealers come up who, to visit, to help me move from Lawrence, Kansas, who've been in the business 40 years, and they have been in every university district in the country, all the restaurants. And after our third dinner at Camdy, I said, you know, there's this great set of restaurants. And um, in Minneapolis, I really want to take you. You've come to do this free for me. I want to take you to someplace really, really special. And they said, there are so few um, genuine places left anymore that we'll just stay here. We want to stay here in Dinky Town. This is a real place. So I would ask you to um, approve or to uphold the HBC decision to deny demolition permit at this time and to allow the designation of the historic district to go forward without this um, piece being demolished. I would like to uh, note that the landowner resolution of support for the hotel project uh, is, uh, is um, not germane, as the chair and the council have explained, to the decision today. Thank you. Thank you. Can I get another show of hands of, of, of the folks who would like to speak? OK, great. Just a few more, so uh, thank you. Uh, please remember to stay to the three-minute time frame. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the council. My name is Gary Etson, 
and I am one of the owners of the property at 1315 4th Street is one of the subject properties before you. I'm also an owner of two other commercial properties in the next block over. So I've been an owner of commercial properties in the Dinkytown Business District for 24 years. Um, I regularly talk and converse with property owners and business owners. I'm very familiar with the district. And I'm asking you to reverse the action of the, APC, of the HPC and allow these demolitions to go forward. As to the merits before you, you know, we're, we're blessed with a, a highly skilled professional staff. They knew this would be a controversial uh, matter. They uh, generated uh, significant and in-depth analysis, and their reports are thorough. So I would urge you to read the staff reports on these applications. They are compelling, and they got it right. As a property owner, we are not involved in the small area plan. And I disagree with Kristen's comment that our views are not germane. Um, let me just give you a property owner's perspective on a couple of themes you've heard from the neighborhood association. One is to address the notion that these demolitions must be stopped in order to preserve the character of Dinkytown. We all love the character of Dinkytown. But that character has more to do with its geographic location and its demographics than any particular building or buildings. As long as the Dinkytown district, business district, is in the shadow of the U, we will be overrun with students and grad students and people who are, on a full-time basis, engaged in serious academic pursuits. And that gives us a different flavor as a neighborhood. It's unique. It's edgy. It's progressive. It's uh, bohemian. And Dinkytown has that nature. But not because we have a particular building, it's because of the demographics. And it's been that way for 70 years. So if you can imagine a huge helicopter picks up these four, this four block area, takes it over and puts it down at 50th in France, the, the culture and the character of the neighborhood at 50th in France would be what's there now. It's not the buildings that create it. It's the people who use the buildings on a daily basis. That is not to say that there aren't historic structures in Dinkytown worth preserving. The property owners recognize that, and, um, and certainly as a group, I'm sure we could agree on what those structures would be. Uh, but any effort to impose some restrictions on those buildings to preserve them should be carefully focused on those properties that are truly worth preserving. These three subject properties are not. Staff got it right. There's nothing historic or architecturally significant enough to mandate their preservation and to avoid their demolition. And finally, I just want to address the property owner's perspective on the potential of having a hotel in the center of Dinkytown. We're very excited about it. Uh, a hotel, when, when the developer originally approached this site, they were talking about a student housing project. And you know, student housing is good. It's done a lot of good things for Dinkytown. But if you build a student housing project that 400 students can live in, I mean, that's great. They will frequent Dickytown businesses. They will add to our vitality. But they only turn once a year. So you'll have the same 400 people for a year, and then they'll turn over, and you'll get another batch of 400 people. A hotel is totally different. A hotel in the center of Dinkytown will attract, with its meeting rooms, and certainly people at the university need meeting space. So those will be full at lunchtime and at, in the evenings, and the rooms themselves. You've got maybe 200 people a day going to that hotel. And these are unique visitors. They wouldn't be in Dinkytown but for the hotel. And the 200 that are in there Monday are different than the 200 that are in there Tuesday. It turns over every day. So if you do the math, with the student housing project, you get 400 kids there for a year. If the number 200, as an illustration, is the number, and those turn every day, you do the math for 365 days, that's 73,000 unique visitors to the center core of Dinkytown. That's going to really enhance the economic vitality. The, the property owners see that. They see the potential. They see the economic impact. And they see that as a great benefit to the businesses and the owners in Dinkytown. That's why we're excited about it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Uh, good early afternoon. Uh, my name is Jeff Myers. Um, I own 1319, uh, the property in question. I had to kind of laugh at uh, what was said about Blarney's. My father has owned this uh, building for 
35 years, I own it via contract for deed. And uh, we have disassembled every front on that building. The top structure of the building has been modified um, when I bought the building. The back of the building is modified. Um, there's nothing historical <laughs> hardly on it except for the brick and mortar on the outside. Um, and that, as, as we know, I probably need to do some repairs on. Um, this was bought as an investment from my father. Um, he was a barber in the uni university area for 35 years. When he came out of barber school, he went there. There was a barber shop, gave the guy a card, said, call me. 20 years later, he got the call, purchased it. <laughs> it took a long time. But uh, long story short, he bought it with the ideal of owning property, having that value go up, running his business in there, and, and doing that. And I, I, I do have to say, I never thought in a million years when I purchased it from him that I was going to have to fight to be able to sell my building. I think, um, I think when you look at the university and the building as a whole, um, since I've been involved with that building, I believe we've had 12 different businesses plus go through 1319. Um, and if you look at the history, I, I learned something today. There was actually other businesses in there. I think uh, it was hit on the head. It is not the building that is bringing people there. We all know it's the university, it's the events, it's the activities that are going there. We're not taking that away. So I definitely would say I would recommend not to prevent demolition and progression. Something new, bringing in 73, potentially 73,000 new people into the Dinky Town area. Thank you. Thanks. It looked like that was the final uh, person, but does anyone else want to speak? Great, seeing none, I will close the public hearing uh, and see if any of my colleagues have questions. Uh, seeing none, I will move to deny the appeal of each of these separate uh, applications. And, no, sorry, to, excuse me, I will move to uphold the appeal for each of these separate applications in order to move this conversation along. So just to clarify, to uh, support the demolition of each of these separate buildings. Uh, I'm doing that for several reasons. Uh, number one, I'm an alumni of the University of Minnesota. And it's hard to believe, but it's been almost 20 years since I was there as a student. I have a lot of fond memories of this place, but like many people have said, I think that it had a lot more to do with my time at the university than any specific buildings in the area. Um, the second thing is that I've heard a lot of concerns about um, impacts of development, but that's really not the question here today. The question is for these three specific buildings. Um, so with that, I'll open up um, for any of my colleagues to um, contribute to the conversation. And I am using speaker management, but please feel free to also um, just use your cards uh, however you'd like. Madam Chair, just, just a point of clarification. So your motion is to um, grant the appeal approve the demolitions and in doing so the, the your motion would include the adoption of the staff report um, recommended findings and, and the recommendation of demo thank you mr. Nielsen yes that's correct council member Johnson thank you madam chair and I just want to thank everyone who is here today who came out to speak on this issue those who sent emails uh, it's amazing to hear these stories uh, some very powerful stories that were shared, the voice of students that came out and the property owners as well. Uh, I agree with a lot of you that there's emotions and memories connected to this. I actually have gone to Mesa Pizza countless times uh, with my buddy Tony. He lived in Dinky Town and we spent just a ton of time going there. And actually over the weekend, I went several times to Dinky Town and even this week I went there uh, to really get a feel for this decision that we have today. I certainly agree it's a unique commercial area uh, and it's there's a lot of history within that area as well. Uh, I do want to be very clear that we're not deciding on uh, whether or not this is the fabric of the historic district and this concept of the historic district or this big hotel coming in or anything like that or even the difficulty of finding parking in the area which is something that uh, we heard today. This is really about these individual buildings and whether they are historically significant. And 
when it does come to what Dinky Town is and these buildings, we do see a lot of small commercial brick facade. It does add scale. It adds continuity to the area. And so the question I'm wrestling with is if we do not allow these buildings to be demolished, what if somebody wanted to build a small commercial brick facade building that's only one, maybe two stories that fits into that area that is going to have architectural significance, that is going to have artistic significance? Would we not allow that? Because we saw these buildings as somehow being historic. And when I look at uh, especially 1319, which I think is probably the, the biggest candidate for being a historic building, I don't see it. I've driven around uh, my ward. I've looked at similar buildings as well and really reflected on this. And this is a, uh, granted, an old brick building, an old facade. Uh, but even as the owner has stated, it's been modified so many times, remodeled and changed. Now, if anybody was to say, let's demolish Loring Pasta Bar, I'd be the first up in arms with that. I mean, just spending the weekend in Dinky Town and looking at that building, we see so many artistic components to that. We see uh, statues over the doorways, this old glass, all of this stuff. It's beautiful. Um, but what we're looking at with this particular building is really a plain old brick building and trying to decide if that in and of itself is historic. Uh, I also wonder about the rights of private landowners and their, uh, how much ability the city has to get involved with these transactions. And I think it would have to be a fairly high bar in terms of historical significance for us to say, no, you don't have the ability to sell your property uh, and do with it as you please because this building truly has some artistic value, some history that is uh, worth preserving. So that is why I would uh, support the motion by Chair Bender, uh, specifically in regards to these three buildings, I frankly do not see the historical value of each building on its own merits, which is ultimately what we're here to decide. And I'd like to remind folks that going forward, the discussion around a hotel or anything like that, that's a whole nother conversation. And that's an important conversation to have as to whether that scale is appropriate for the neighborhood, whether it contributes to the continuity of that district, whether it adds uh, that small commercial feel and look and all that. And that's a conversation that would happen if this moved forward. Uh, so thank you, Madam Chair, and I'll yield to my colleagues. Thank you, Councilmember Johnson. Council President Johnson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to move a substitute, which is to uh, grant uh, uh, the appeal at uh, 1315 Forest Street Southeast and grant the appeal at 410 13th Avenue Southeast, but deny the appeal at 1319 Forest Street Southeast um, and uh, find that 1319 is a historic resource. And I'm going to ask Mr. Nielsen to help me with uh, other um, uh, remarks that I have to make or other uh, parts of a motion to um, uh, deny that appeal at 1319. Yes, uh, uh, Chair Bender, Council President Johnson. So for the portion uh, for 1315 and 410 where you have made a motion to grant the appeal, which would be to approve the demo, you can adopt planning staff findings that have been made in that regard. Okay. For a motion to deny the appeal with regard to 1319, which would be to deny the demo, you'll want to speak to that motion um, and then direct staff to draft the appropriate findings for presentation to the full council. All right, thank you. Madam Chair, may I continue? Yeah. All right. Um, then I would move uh, as part of my motion um, to uh, adopt staff recommendations for both uh, 1315 4th Street Southeast and 410 13th Avenue Southeast. Uh, and then on uh, 1319 4th Street Southeast, again, to uh, deny the appeal um, and uh, direct staff to uh, adopt or to uh, um, recommend findings for adoption. Um, and I, I just, uh, at looking at these three properties, I think um, it is clear that the one that does have the um, nature of a historic resource is um, 1319. Um, you know, Council Member Johnson, I was listening to your, to your remarks about, um, um, what's the name of the other, uh, Loring Pasta Bar. 
Well, that's a two-story two building, and so it has, you know, it has maybe some more charm than a one-story build, building, but one-story buildings were also part of the way that neighborhood developed. And I appreciate what people are saying. I was actually over at the University of Minnesota campus um, yesterday um, on the West Bank and uh, with my husband who went there uh, as a young man many years ago. And, you know, how that we were we were just kind of laughing because you know how much the campus has changed how things change is part of you know the way a city works but i think when you have an opportunity to uh, make a statement about a um the flavor of what that place looked like in the beginning i think this particular building at 1319 offers that and so i I um, am sympathetic uh, uh, to um, the concern of the neighborhood to uh, do or to find all three buildings in, uh, as historic, but I'm more, I'm much more compelled by 1319. So I make that motion. So I'm going to need some procedural help because we have two motions on the floor. Oh, and. We have a motion and an amendment. I think we actually have two separate motions. And 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 I sure. and Councilmember Goodman would like to also speak. But yeah, I was, I was going to say, Chairman, why don't we? I'll, I'll defer to Councilmember Goodman. Who Thank you, can clarify. Mr. Nelson. Um, my my thought is that we just vote on each one separately. So if Councilmember Johnson and Council Chair Bender would withdraw their motions, you can make a motion on each. They're all listed separately on the agenda. And then everyone can vote the way they want on each of the buildings, which would perhaps be the cleanest way to do it. So my recommendation, uh, as a friendly recommendation to those who had made motions, would be to withdraw and then call the question on each individual property. Thank you, Councilmember Goodman. I think that's very reasonable. So I will withdraw my motion. As will I, Madam Chair. Wonderful. Thank you. So um, I will move to uh, uphold the appeal for... 3112 3rd Avenue South and uh, to uh, allow the demolition of that building and I will see if there's any comment or discussion Chair Bender. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm looking at the wrong address uh, Oh, so the first one is um, I'll let someone else make that motion <laughs> Council President Johnson uh, Madam Chair I would um, uh, on item 3 uh, deny the appeal um, from Doran Development, um, from the decision of the Heritage Preservation uh, Commission, and um, direct staff to um, uh, incorporate findings for um, adoption, um, and um, just use my previous remarks. Is that okay, Mr. Nielsen? Uh, Chair Bender, Council President Johnson, yes, that, that is okay. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, I'll see if anyone else have comments. I just want to um, explain my position on this building. I represent a part of the town that has a number of one-story brick buildings, and one of those corridors is Nicollet Avenue, where the city has uh, indicated preference to build a streetcar um, as an economic development tool. And so I don't know how I can support um, designating this particular one-story brick building as historically significant. And then with a straight face, uh, look at my constituents in Ward 10 and uh, look at that corridor as a place that we have uh, designated for economic growth. And I just feel that it's important to be consistent and that historic preservation is a field of study that I take very seriously. I think it is very important for our city to um, truly capture our historic resources. I want to make sure that our staff's time, which is very limited, is, desig is directed toward um, you know, designating the historic resources that we have, ensuring that we're bringing the appropriate funds in for properties that are eligible for the National Register of Historic Places, um, for going through the long list of potential historic districts that we have identified over 50 potential historic districts in our city. Uh, and so I just want to make sure that we are um, using historic preservation appropriately and that um, in this case I just can't in good conscience uh, vote that this is an historic resource. Are there any other comments from my colleagues? Yes. Councilmember Johnson. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. I would be interested in hearing uh, any of my colleagues who are interested in preserving this building articulate what it specifically is about this building that, especially as it's been changed and remodeled and all of this, what makes this building historic? And if they would also be against the demolition 
of this building if it was in their wards uh, as well, because I think that's important. We're really here today to decide if this particular building is historic and all these other aspects of that uh, are not for us to decide in this meeting as we've heard from council. Thank you. Thank you, Council President Johnson. Uh, Madam Chair, our uh, rules, uh, committee rules, do really uh, not encourage council members to question other council members um, for the reasons behind their actions. Wonderful. Thank you, Council President Johnson. Council Member Goodman. Thank you, Council President Johnson. But I'll rise to that occasion, actually, even though it's completely out of our customary way of treating each other, to note that this is not about designating the building historic. It's about whether or not we're going to commence a study to determine whether or not it's historic. And I think enough information has been given by the neighbors today to determine that this deserves a study. Should it be studied and determined by the professionals that it's not historic, the applicant will be given practically an automatic authorization to, demol to demolish the building. So all we're asking today is to study the significance of this particular building and determine down the road after a study has done whether or not this building is deemed historic. And I, for one, would never say no to studying it given the testimony I've heard today. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Uh, with that, I will. Um, we have a motion to deny the appeal for 1319 4th Street Southeast. All those in favor, please say aye. All those opposed say nay, nay, and the motion carries. Um, I will move um, to grant the appeal um, for 1315 4th Street Southeast and see if my colleagues have any comments. Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. That motion carries. I will move to grant the appeal um, for 410 13th Avenue Southeast and pause to see if there's any questions or comments. Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And all those opposed, nay. That motion carries. Uh, all right, is there any other um, comments or questions from the committee? Seeing none, I will close this session.